In this lecture, let me introduce JavaScript to you. JavaScript is one of the most popular front-end languages using which you can create web functionality in the web page. Basically, you can design the structure of the elements in the web page by using HTML language. You can apply the styles and align them by using CSS. So that what is missing in this case is that the functionality. That means the web page should be interactive with the user, right? When the user gives the input, the web page has to produce the corresponding output based on the given input. That is called functionality. That can be accomplished by using JavaScript. For example, in Google, whenever we type something, automatically corresponding results should be appear. So this is called as interactive nature of the web page, which is also called as functionality. This kind of things can be achieved by using JavaScript. Using JavaScript, you can show or hide the information in the web page. For example, when we click some menu icon, the corresponding menu should be opened. This can be done by using JavaScript. Also, in the calculator applications, Whenever we give some inputs, corresponding results should be appear, right? For example, in this application, I am trying to give some inputs. And based on these given inputs, corresponding results should be calculated and displayed here, right? So this kind of things can be achieved by using JavaScript. So overall, to make the web page interactive with the user, we use JavaScript. Basically, JavaScript executes within the browsers. For example, in the browsers such as Google Chrome, Edge, Safari, Opera, Mozilla Firefox, in all the modern browsers, JavaScript is by default supported. But not only that, JavaScript can also be executed on the server or any other system where the JavaScript interpreter is available that is actually possible by using Node.js. So what is Node.js? Node.js makes it possible to execute the JavaScript on a machine independently without the browser. So overall, JavaScript can execute within the browser or can be executed independently on the system by using Node.js. Within the web page, JavaScript is mainly used to manipulate elements in the web page, that is to update the output of the elements. For example, when we click on the calculate button, there should be some calculation, that means some mathematical process should be occurred, and then the output should be reflected in the web page. So using JavaScript, you can manipulate HTML elements to update the corresponding output based on the given inputs. So JavaScript is mainly meant for user interaction in the web page. JavaScript is a case sense to language, so you should write the code correctly in the proper case, whether it is uppercase or lowercase. So while you learn the language concepts, you should remember whether it is uppercase or lowercase letter, and you should exactly use it accurately in the same case, otherwise the code will not work. So basically whenever a language can identify the differentiation between uppercase letter and lowercase letter, it is called as case and stool language and JavaScript is a case and stool language. And also JavaScript is basically interpreted language, which means that each line of the JavaScript will be independently executed by the browsers so browsers convert each line of the JavaScript code independently into the machine language at execution time. So JavaScript developers need not perform any prior compilation process before execution. JavaScript can access all the HTML elements or CSS styles that are written in HTML and CSS language. JavaScript can do manipulations on HTML elements. For example, JavaScript can add or remove or update any HTML tags that are already present in the web page. 
For example, it can take some variables like this, can perform mathematical process, for example addition of numbers, and then it can display the result in a specific place in the web page by updating that HTML tag. So JavaScript is basically case sense to interpreted and dynamic language to make the web page interactive with the user. And using JavaScript, you can capture the user events such as keyboard or mouse actions and can do some process based on the requirement. For example, if the user clicks on some arrow button, some more information should be opened or expanded. This can be possible by using JavaScript. And JavaScript was developed by Brendan E.H. at Netscape Corporation. So initially JavaScript was supported by Netscape Navigator browser earlier, but later it is open source and now it is one of the recommendations of W3C. JavaScript is also called as ECMAScript. Actually, ECMAScript is the specification of W3C. So, based on the ECMAScript, the browser development companies implement that language as JavaScript. So, only the language specification without implementation is called as ECMAScript. And when it is practically implemented in the browsers, it is called as JavaScript. Still, ECMAScript specifications are being released by ECMA International. It is an open source community for the web. And based on the ECMAScript only, JavaScript is actually being implemented by the browser development companies such as Google, Microsoft, etc. That means whenever a specific company releases a JavaScript interpreter, then it is called as JavaScript while it is in the document format that is as a specification it is called as ECMAScript. That is why all the version numbers of ECMAScript and JavaScript are exactly same. Initially JavaScript was developed by Netscape Corporation in 1997 so it is called as JavaScript 1 or you can say ECMAScript 1. ECMAScript in short can be called as ES. So ES1 or JS1 that is released in 1997 and then JavaScript 2 in 1998 and then JavaScript 3 in 1999 and then as you can see JavaScript 4, 5, 6 all these are released. Starting from ECMAScript 6 it was no longer called as ES6 it is called as 2015 version. So, another name of ES6 is JavaScript 2015. So, later as of now, ECMAScript 2020 was released, which is also called as internally ECMAScript 11 version. Actually, JavaScript 5 was the standard version, which was released in December 2019. In JavaScript 5 or 5.1, functions and objects topic is focused and in 2015 version that is ECMAScript 6 JavaScript classes are introduced. Later in the further updates after ECMAScript 2015 some minor concepts have been introduced in JavaScript. So this is the brief introduction to JavaScript. Let's get started by creating first application in JavaScript in the next lecture. So let us get started with JavaScript by creating the first example. You can execute the JavaScript in three ways. One is internal JavaScript, next external JavaScript or by using Node.js at command prompt. Whenever you want to execute the JavaScript code within the browser, you can try using internal JavaScript. But in this case, your JavaScript code cannot be shared with multiple HTML files. That means whenever you want to execute your JavaScript code only within the single web page but not across multiple files, then you can use internal JavaScript. 
So your JavaScript is only for internally within the same HTML file. But sometimes in the large applications, you want to execute your JavaScript code shared among multiple HTML files. In that case, you will use external JavaScript. But sometimes you don't want to execute your JavaScript code on the browser, but instead you want to practice the JavaScript features or you want to use your JavaScript to execute our server side code. Means as a server, you want to receive the request, do the process or provide the functionality to the browser. So for doing the tasks of server side programming, you can use your JavaScript on the command prompt by using Node.js. And in the same way, to practice the basic features of JavaScript, such as functions, objects, or arrays, executing the JavaScript code on the command prompt is better. So in Visual Studio Code, let me open a folder that is C colon JavaScript. So in C drive, I am trying to create a folder that is JavaScript. In that folder, let me create a file. For example, first.js. Yes, for all the JavaScript code, the file extension must be .js. It indicates that we are using JavaScript in this file. So straight away you can write any JavaScript code, whatever you wish. You need not follow any specific structure unlike C or Java language. For example, I am using the output statement in JavaScript that is console.log and within the parenthesis, I am trying to use a value, for example, a number like 1. You can supply any other value, can be a number or a string value. A string value is a collection of characters that is mentioned inside your codes either double quotes or single quotes. For example, I am trying to write something in the double quotes that is hello. And also I am using another value that is high and that is in single quotes. If you open double quotes, we have to close the same with double quotes. And if you open single quotes, we have to close it with single quotes. So what is this console.log? Console.log is a predefined function which receives our value and do something based on that. That is, it displays the actual value that you supply. So what exactly a function do? A function is a collection of statements that performs some operation or calculation and provides some result or output for the same. For example, there is a function called sqrt. If you supply a number for the same, it automatically calculates and return the square root of the same. So a function is meant for doing some work, that is some operation based on the given value. So just like that, this console.log is a predefined function which receives our value that you supply here and automatically the given value will be displayed in the command prompt as output. Since the console.log is a function, while calling it, we have to use the parenthesis after the function name. So after writing your function name, we have to open the parenthesis and close the same. And in JavaScript, every statement ends with a semicolon. Even though the semicolon is optional, it is highly recommended. It tells the JavaScript interpreter that a particular statement has been completed. So let us save this program. Open the command prompt window by just typing cmd in the start menu. And then we have to locate to that particular folder where our file is present. As of now, our first.js file is present in C current JavaScript. So at your practice time also, you need to check the folder 
in which folder you saved the file. So open that particular folder by using cd. Here cd is the command that tells that we want to locate a specific folder which is also called as change directory. So we have to write cd and c colon javascript. And in case if you are in a different drive such as d drive or e drive, switch to c drive because my folder is currently inside the c colon only. So overall make sure this current working folder is located in the command prompt window that is c colon javascript in my case. So once you are sure that that folder is located in this command prompt window, specify the command that is node followed by the actual javascript file name. So what this node command will do is that it internally invokes the javascript interpreter that executes each and every line of the javascript code. So it executes all these mentioned statements one after another at top to bottom approach. So as you can see it first executes the first statement and as a result we got the output 1. And then it goes to the second statement that is console.log of hello. So we got hello for the same. And then it move on to the next statement that is console.log of hi. You got hi in the output. So JavaScript interpreter by default executes all the statements of the JavaScript file top to bottom approach. It by default it doesn't skip any statements. It executes all the statements top to bottom. Of course, some statements may not generate the real output in the command prompt window, but it do execute all the statements from top to bottom. By default, Node.js internally uses a JavaScript engine called V8, which is actually developed by Google. So that V8 JavaScript engine acts as a JavaScript interpreter that executes our actual JavaScript code. So overall we have to write the code in a specific file at specific folder and we have to locate that particular folder by using cd command and then we have to supply the command called node space the actual JavaScript file name so that you will get corresponding output. Internally, JavaScript interpreter executes all the statements of the file in top to bottom approach. This is what we have understood from this lecture. So what is a variable in JavaScript? Variable is a named memory location in RAM to store a value in the memory so that you can use it for calculation or showing the output to the user. You will accept inputs from the user and do the calculations such as addition or subtraction and show the result to the user. So all these values must be stored in the memory temporarily while running the program, right? So each value will be stored in its own location and that location is called as variable. So a variable is a symbol in program to store a value. In JavaScript, you can use the var keyword to create the variable. For creation of single or multiple variables also, you will use the same keyword that is var. A keyword is a predefined name that is also called as reserved name. So that a keyword has a specific meaning in the language. So the exact meaning of where keyword is to declare or create the variable. That means you are trying to talk to the JavaScript interpreter that you need a variable so allocate some memory for the same. But do remember the JavaScript is the loosely typed or dynamically typed language. Which means that you cannot fix a specific data type for the variable while declaring or even later. In JavaScript, 
you can assign any type of value at any point of time into the variable. For example, you have created a variable in JavaScript. Initially, you have assigned a number, but later you assigned a string value into the same. It is absolutely possible to assign any type of value into the variable in JavaScript. Means, the JavaScript variables doesn't fix with a particular data type. You can absolutely assign any type of value into the variable at any point of time. So, in JavaScript variables, the value and data type can be changed any number of times and any time. And the default value of a variable is undefined in JavaScript, which means that if you declare a variable but you have not initialized the same, the default value of that variable is undefined, which indicates that the value is not assigned by the developer. And moreover, in JavaScript, you can use the variable without a declaration also. So, for example, without assigning any value into a variable, let's say x, you can directly print or use that value of the variable, but in that case, it gives you undefined because that variable is not already declared. Like this, in a program, you will store all the input values of the user and also all the values of calculations and also all the output that you want to display to the user. A variable can store any type of value such as number, string, boolean, function, object, etc. So, in SQL and JavaScript folder, let me create another file that is variables.js and here we are trying to declare a variable by using the var keyword. Here, var is the reserved word or keyword in JavaScript. It is not a data type. So, after var, we must give a space and then you can declare any variable name. The variable name can be uppercase or lowercase or camel case or pascal case. The variable name can be almost anything. It can be shorter or longer, but should not have spaces especially. And also, variable names should not include with the spaces or any other special characters except underscore. But it can include underscore and dollar in JavaScript. For example, I am trying to declare the variable called x and it is not initialized. That means the default value of that variable is undefined. So, in memory, the variable x equal to undefined now. So, the default value of the x is undefined, which means that the developer has not initialized the value manually. So, undefined is the default value in JavaScript language for all the variables. So, I am trying to print the value of the x. So, we should write console.log of the variable name that is x. Here, the parentheses are pronounced as of. So, we can say log of x. Alright, now if we can check the console.log output, that is node variables.js, you can see the output that is undefined. Because in JavaScript, the default value of any variable is undefined. You can assign any value into the same. So, you can declare any variable with any name. For example, I am trying to declare the variable called name and its default value, for example, squat. And let me declare another variable of numerical type. For example, is is the name of the variable and its value is 20. So, I would like to print the value of name as well as age. So, let's run that program that is node variables.js. You can see the variable called squat. 
So the current value of the variable name is Scott and the current value of the age is 20. So whenever the first line of the code has been executed, it just declares a variable called name. It stores the value Scott in the memory, but it doesn't give any output by default for the first line. Similarly, it stores the value 20 in the variable called age by using the second statement. It doesn't give any output by default. But next time in the third statement, whenever you write console.log of name, then only it prints the actual value of the name variable that is Scott. And in the same way on the next line, we are getting the output of age variable. So like this, where is the keyword to declare the variable? Of course, for the name, you are getting some deprecated message. Just ignore that. And you can declare multiple variables in the same statement. That is just like this. See, I am declaring both variables, that is name as well as age, in the single statement. So you need not write where in the next statement. And we are getting the same output. So you may or may not initialize the variables in the where statement. So for example, we have initialized the value of name variable, but not for age. If you want, you can initialize that value also in the same statement. So you need not write the second statement now, because in the same statement itself, we have created both variables and initialized both variables. And we are getting the same output from this code also. So overall, what do you understand from this lecture is, a variable is a named memory location in RAM to store a specific value. You can assign almost any type of value into the variable. For example, initially it is numerical type, later you have assigned a string value, and again later you have assigned a boolean value. So you can store almost any type of value and you can change the value of the variable any point of time. To get the latest value of the variable in the output, we can use that console.log and we can provide the variable name without quotes in the parentheses so that we are getting that current value in the output. And JavaScript is the dynamically typed or loosely typed data type which means that we cannot fix a particular variable to a specific data type. The variable can change its type at any point of time. Now let's try to assign other than strings and numbers. We can create a variable for a boolean type of value here, true or false, that is logical values are called as boolean type. And also you can create a variable to store any type of numbers that is large or small or positive or negative or integer type or floating point type. That means you can store the numbers with fraction part or without fraction part. And in the same way, you can store the reference of a function. So this variable d acts as a reference variable to reference that particular function. We will understand more about the functions in the further sections, so don't get confused. And also we can store the reference of an object into the variable. We will understand about the objects in the further sections. And in the same way, we can store the reference of an array into the variable. So the square brackets represent arrays, the curly braces represent object and this is the function. So the variable called d stores reference of a function and the variable called e stores the reference of an object. The variable f stores reference of array. We will understand more about functions, objects, arrays in the further lectures. So don't get confused. And we can print the values of all these variables. And for single line comment, we can use a double slash. 
so that we can write single line comment in JavaScript or we can write multiple lines of comment by using slash star and end with star slash. So for multiple lines of comment, we can use this slash star and for single line comment, we can use double slash. So let us check the output of this program. So as you can expect, we are getting the values of all the variables that is a string type, number type, boolean type, again number with fraction part and then functions and then object as well as array. So this is how to use the variables in JavaScript. An operator is a symbol in JavaScript language which performs some specific operation. For example, plus is for addition operation. In JavaScript, we have six types of operators that is arithmetical operators, assignment, increment, decrement, relational, logical and concatenation operators. The arithmetical operators are plus, minus, asterisk or star and then slash and mode operator. The assignment operators, as you can see, equal to, plus equal to, minus equal to, star equal to, etc. And plus plus minus minus or the increment decrement operators, equal to equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, all these are relational operators. In the same way, double ampersand, double pipe and negation these are logical operators. And then finally, concatenation operator is plus. The free courses of Udemy can contain maximum of 2 hours content. So, because of limited time, we are unable to show examples on each kind of operators practically. But in brief, the plus operator is used to perform addition, minus is for subtraction, Asterisk or star is for multiplication, slash is for division. The percentage or modulus operator is used to find out remainder after division. And now coming to assignment operators. The equal to operator is used to assign a value into a variable. Plus equal to means first you want to perform numerical addition, then you want to add the result into the target variable. And after that minus equal to first performs the subtraction and then assigns the result value into the variable. And in the same way, asterisk equal to performs multiplication first and assigns the result value into the target variable. And in the same way, we have a slash equal to as well as mod equal to. And now coming to increment decrement operators that is plus plus and minus minus. Whereas plus plus operator increases the value by 1 and minus minus operator decreases the value by 1. And these operators can be used as prefix and postfix operators. If you are using plus plus or minus minus before the variable name that is called prefix operator which performs that addition or subtraction first and then returns the value. And in the same way, if you are using the same right side of the variable, it is called postfix operator, which first returns the current value of the variable and then performs that incrementation or decrementation operation. And now coming to relational operators, it can be used for comparison between two values, whether both are equal or not. And in the same way, you can compare two values whether those are not equal by using not equal to operator. And in the same way, we can compare two values for less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, etc. And now coming to logical operators. The end operator that is double ampersand expects both conditions must be true. And the double pipe symbol that is OR operator expects at least any one of the conditions is true. 
and the not operator reverses the condition. That means true become false, false become true. And finally, the concatenation operator concatenates two strings or string and number and produces a string. That means it attaches the second value at the end of the first value. For example, it attaches the last name at the end of the first name. This is the briefing of all these operators. So because of the time limit of free courses, we are unable to show examples on each. But we are providing detailed lectures on all these operators in the paid course of Udemy. So if you are interested, you can check the course called Web Development Course. It's a good value for money because it covers complete HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript and all the updates of ECMAScript including Node.js, Bootstrap and jQuery. In this lecture, we are trying to understand the first form of if, that is simple if, and this simple if comes under the category of conditional control statements. So what is this simple if and how does it work? Let us understand simple if with a flowchart. First we will write if, and in the parenthesis we will write the condition. If the condition is true, this particular block of the code will be executed. Here, you will define a block of the statements as a collection of statements. You can write one or more statements in this block. And a code block begins with the opening brace and the same block ends with the closing brace. So, all the statements that are present in between the opening and closing of the brace comes under a block. So, first JavaScript interpreter checks the condition. If the condition is true, this block will be executed, otherwise this block will be skipped. Let us understand the same process with the flowchart. Here is the beginning of the flowchart and then we are checking this condition. The condition might be either true or false. It never be both at a time. So if the condition is true, the true block executes. That means the block that is present here will execute. And after that, it reaches to end of the if statement. That means it goes to the next statement that is present after the if statement. But in case if the condition is false, no block will be executed, means indirectly it will jump out of this block and go to the next statement that is present after the if. This is how does the simple if work. So let me demonstrate simple if. Let me create a new file that is simple if.js. And here I would like to print exam result of a student. And we are assuming the minimum pass marks is 35. Let us create a variable that is secured marks. And let's assign the value into that. For example, 60. You can assign any value between 0 to 100. And moreover, it is strongly recommended to follow camel case while creating variable names in JavaScript. The meaning of camel case is, it begins with lowercase letter and after that every word begins with uppercase letter. Here the word secured begins with lowercase letter that is yes. And the next word that is marks begins with uppercase letter that is M. And of course, you never give a space within the variable name. In case if you give space within the variable name that is completely invalid. So always remember variable names never have spaces or any other special characters except underscore or dollar. So we have a variable called secured marks and it has some value, for example, 60. And as of this stage, don't worry how do you read these inputs from the keyboard. We have to get the values from the text boxes, but it is possible only when you know DOM manipulations. 
But in order to enter into DOM manipulations, you should know complete details about functions, objects and arrays. That's what we are trying to learn now. In the next section, we will understand functions. After that, arrays and objects. After that only, you will be able to understand DOM manipulations. Then you are able to read the values from the text boxes. In that way, you can accept inputs from the user then. But as of now, let us initialize some fixed values into the variables for understanding the control structures. Anyways, here my goal is that I would like to check the secured marks. If the secured marks is less than the minimum pass marks, then it is fail, otherwise pass. So here I would like to check the condition. If the secured marks of the student is less than the minimum pass marks, that is 35, I would like to print a message called fail. So the first condition is if the secured marks of the student is less than the minimum pass marks that is 35, then I would like to print a message that is fail. But we may have other possibility also, right? The secured marks of the student might be greater than 35. So we are writing another if condition for the same. If the secured marks is greater than or equal to 35, means if this condition is true, for example, the student secures more marks, let's say for example 40 or 70 or something, in that case, I would like to print another message, let's say for example pass. So if the first condition is true, the first message will be shown that is fail. And if the second condition is true, the second message will be printed. That's all. Let's execute this code. Let's look at C colon JavaScript and node followed by the file name that is simpleif.js. So currently we are getting pass because the secured marks is 60. So whenever secured marks is 60 like this, 60 less than 35 condition is false. So this code will not be executed. And after that, it checks the second condition. Secured marks is 60 as of now. 60 greater than or equal to 35 condition is true. So that it fully executes the true block of the second if. So we got the output as pass. But in case if the secured marks is less than 35, let's say for example 25, the first condition is true, right? See, 25 is less than 35, condition is true. So we will get fail. And after that it checks the second condition, 25 greater than or equal to 35, condition is false. So the second block will be skipped here. So if we are correct, we should get fail as output and we got the same. So like this, you are checking independent conditions by using simple if. If the condition is true, then only you are executing certain block, otherwise not. This is how to work with the simple if. The second type of if is if else. Here we have one condition but two blocks. If the condition is true, the true block will be executed. But if the condition is false, the false block will be executed. The block which is present after the if is called as true block. Here you will write the code what you want to do when the condition is true. And the block that is present after the else is called as false block. Here you will write the statements that you want to execute when the condition was false. Let us understand how does it work with the flowchart. This is the beginning of if else. Here we are checking the condition. The condition might be either true or false. If the condition is true, the true block executes. 
So this block executes completely and after that it reaches to end of the if. That means indirectly the else block will be skipped here. But in case if the condition is false, only the false block will be executed but not the true block. So indirectly when the condition is false, it skips the true block, directly jump to the false block and execute all that code. After executing the false block, it goes to the next statement that is present after the if. So if the condition is true, it comes in this direction, it executes all the code of the true block and after that it goes to the next statement that is present after the if. But in case if the condition is false, it directly jump to the false block that is else case and execute all this code. Indirectly the true block will be skipped here. And after completion of false, it goes to the next statement that is present after the if. And after that it continues normally as usual. This is how does it work in case of if else. So in the real world applications, whenever you have something to do when the condition is true and you want to execute some other code when the condition is false, in that case you will use if else. For example, if the book is already opened, you want to close it. If the book is already closed, you want to reopen it. So you have something to do when the condition is true as well as when the condition is false. For that kind of cases you will use if else. And moreover for one if only one else block is allowed. Let's check the same practically. Let us rewrite the same code of if with if else. Let's copy the code, creating a new file that is if else.js and we have the same code pasted. Now instead of writing another if here, we are just writing else. Means this code is the opposite of the previous. So if the condition is true, the true block executes completely means all the statements that are present in this block will be executed and after that it goes to the next statement that is present after the if. That is any code that is present here will be continued furthermore. But in case if the condition is false, it directly jumps to the else block, indirectly it will skip the if, indirectly it will skip the if statement and executes all the code of the else block and go to the next statement that is present after the if. So what exactly happening is that in either of the cases either true or false, any one of the block only executes, one block is being skipped here. If the condition is true, the false block will be skipped here. If the condition is false, the true block will be skipped here. So, in either of these cases, only one block executes. This is the nature of the if else. Let's check it out. Node if else.js. So, we are written the output correctly, that is fail, because the secured marks is less than pass marks, that is 35. But in case if it is greater than pass marks, so let's say 80. In that case is, see we are getting pass. So it works either of the cases correctly. Let us enter into loops in JavaScript. In JavaScript we have three types of loops that is while, do while and for. In this lecture let us focus on while loop. So when you will go for loops. Whenever you want to execute the code repeatedly for a few times, we have to use the loops in JavaScript. Especially if you talk about while loop, 
we will keep a condition and as long as the condition is true, the block will be keep repeatedly executing. Means, it checks the condition first. If the condition is true, the while block will be executed. Again, it checks the same condition. Again, if it is true, the block will be executed again. Like this, condition checking, block execution. Condition checking, block execution. The same process or cycle repeats as long as the condition is true. But once the condition becomes false, it stops repetition of the while loop. It automatically goes to the next statement that is present after the while. Especially whenever you don't know how many times you want to execute, then it is ideal to use the while loop. For example, you want to check the stock exchange value. As long as it is positive, you want to keep repeating some loop, but you don't know how many times it is positive. So whenever you are not sure how many times you want to execute, then it is better to use the while loop. Of course, if you know how many times to execute, at that time also you can use the while loop. But in that case, it's better to go for for loop instead of while. Let us understand the same process in a flowchart. First, we will start with the initialization. That means you will store some initial value into a looping variable. Let's say for example, i. So, you will store the initial value, for example, i equal to 1. Then you will check the condition. If the condition is true, you want to execute that while block. After that, you want to increase or decrease the value of the variable. Again, you want to go for the same condition once again. Again, if the condition is true, while block execution, incrementation, again condition checking, again it is true. So this process repeats as long as the condition is true. This is called the loop. But once the condition becomes false, it goes to the end of the while loop. Means it jumps to the next statement that is present after the while. So we have a condition. And if the condition is true, the block execution, incrementation or decrementation, again condition checking, again while block execution, again condition checking. So this cycling process repeats as long as the condition is true. For example, you want to execute the loop for 10 times, then you will write this kind of code. You will initialize the i value as 1, but you want to repeat the code execution as long as i value is less than or equal to 10. So if the condition is true, you want to execute this code and increment, again condition checking, execute the code, again increment. So this process cycles multiple times as long as the condition is true. So i value is 1, the code executes. i value is 2, again the code executes. 3, 4, 5, up to 10. But after 10, whenever i value becomes 11, the condition is false. So the loop will be stopped. This is how does the while loop executes. Let us try the same practically. So let me create a file while.js and the requirement is I want to print the numbers that is 1 to 5. So the initialization is i equal to 1 and the condition is i less than or equal to 5. That means as long as the i value is less than 5, then you want to repeat. So if i equal to 1, you want to execute the block. If i equal to 2, again the block execution. Again i equal to 3, again the block. i equal to 4, again the block. i equal to 5, then also the block will be executed. But once that i value becomes 6, 
the condition is false so it stops the loop so we have to increase the value of the i otherwise it goes to the infinite loop that never ends and inside the while block you can write any code for example i am just printing the i value so let's check it out node while.js now you can see the numbers that is between 1 to 5 in visual studio code you can also debug the code that means execute the code line by line to understand the execution sequence in order to do so let me add a breakpoint so near the statement of where i equal to 1 at the left hand side corner just click there it adds a red color mark that is called breakpoint the meaning of breakpoint is that whenever the execution sequence reaches there you want to stop or pause the execution and wait for your command if you want to execute the next line we have to press the key f10 so in order to start debugging go to run menu start debugging and its keyboard shortcut is f5 then it asks for execution environment you can say node.js so it invokes your while.js file through node.exe file that means it is equivalent to the command node space while.js so it pauses whenever it sees the breakpoint then we have to press f10 in order to go to the next statement so in keyboard i am trying to press f10 otherwise you can also use the tool that is f10 that is called step over in case if there is a function call and you want to execute that function definition then you can use the f11 command okay as of now we don't have any functions so let's stick to f10 so i am pressing f10 to go to the next statement as of now the condition is true that's why it enters into the block you can see the output of 1 here and after that the i value increments you can see the current value of the i in the top left corner so that is i equal to 1 as of now but after that i am trying to execute that i plus plus statement by using f10 command now i value becomes 2 again f10 so we got 2 as output here and after that again f10 now i value becomes 3 again f10 again f10 now we got 3 as output again the i value increments here so i value becomes 4 again f10 again f10 so we got the output as 4 again f10 now the i value becomes 5 then again we are checking the condition the condition is true so again we will print that value 5 so we got 5 as output here and again f10 so i value becomes 6 so this is what the point if i equal to 6 the condition is false right because i value is currently 6 6 less than or equal to 5 condition is false so it stops the execution of the while loop it jumps to the next statement that is present after the while and there is no more statement after the while that is end of the program so you will just stop this code and click on the stop button here all right again if you want to re-execute the same code again you will go to run menu start debugging the same process repeats but before using the start debugging option 
make sure we have added the breakpoint at the beginning of the code. You will not add the breakpoint at the comment line, but you will add the breakpoint at the first meaningful statement, just like variable declaration. Again, you can close these windows. Alright. So, whenever you want to execute the code repeatedly, in case if you know how many times you want to repeat or you don't know how many times you want to execute the code, in both cases you can use the while loop. But it is ideal to use the while loop in case if you are not sure how many times you want to execute but you want to stick to some condition which depends on the user input or getting the information from some other resource. For example, as long as the user input is valid, you want to continue the execution. But once the user input is invalid, you want to stop that execution. For that kind of cases, while loop is best. And you can remove the breakpoint by just clicking the breakpoint once again. Now the breakpoint is removed. This is how to work with the while loop. In the next lecture, we will understand do while loop. Now let us focus on for loop, which is one of the most frequently used loops in JavaScript and also in other programming languages such as C language, Java and C sharp. Whenever you know exactly how many times you want to execute the loop, then it is best to go for for loop rather than while loop or do while loop. Because with for loop, you can write initialization, condition and incrementation in a single line instead of writing them in different places and make it confused. See, if you can recollect while loop, you will write the initialization above the loop and write the condition near the while and in the same way, you will write incrementation or decrementation almost at the bottom of the loop. So, you are writing three main points of loop at different places instead of writing them at all at once. So, if there is too much amount of code inside the loop, it will be difficult to identify what is the initial value, what is the ending value, and where is the incrementation or decrementation. So then, it will be better to write all these three in a single line so that anyone can easily understand the initial value, ending value, as well as incrementation or decrementation easily. That is the main point of using for loop. So, in case of for loop, you will write your initialization semicolon and then condition semicolon. Then you will write your incrementation or decrementation. So, you are writing all the three things about loop in a single line so that it will be easy for the developers to identify the initial value, ending value and the step value. That is the main advantage of the for loop, otherwise it is almost same as the while loop. And the execution sequence of the for loop is almost equivalent to while loop. Let us understand the same process through flowchart. This is the beginning of the loop and then we will first execute the initialization and after that we will check the condition. The condition might be either true or false. In case if the condition is true, the for block executes. So all the code that is present inside the loop will be executed. And after completion of the for block execution, it leads to incrementation and then comes back to checking the condition. Again, the condition is true, the for block executes, again incrementation, again the checking the condition. Like this, it keeps repeating as long as the condition is true. So, first it performs initialization only once at initial time. But after that, it keeps repeating the condition and then for block execution and then incrementation, then condition checking. Again, same cycle repeats 
like for block execution, incrementation, condition checking. This process repeats as long as the condition is true. For example, after few times of iteration, condition is false, then automatically it exits from the loop. So overall, initialization executes only once, that is for the first time at the entry level. But after that, condition checking, for block execution, again incrementation, then condition checking. This process keeps repeating as long as the condition is true. This is how does the for loop works. So whenever you know how many times you want to execute the loop, then the for loop is the best. For example, we have 10 students and we want to check the result of each student. So we exactly know how many times the loop should be executed, that is 10 times for 10 students. So for this kind of cases, for loop is the best. Here we are writing the initialization value that is i equal to 1 and the ending value that is 10 means you want to repeat the loop as long as the i value is less than or equal to 10. See all the values like 1, 2, 3, 4, all these are less than 10. But once the i value is reached to 11, the condition becomes false, so it will stop the loop. For the first time, it will begin with the initialization, then condition checking, 1 less than or equal to 10, condition is true. So it executes the block. Then after that, it goes to the incrementation, then condition checking, again the block execution, again incrementation, condition, block. This process keeps repeating as long as the condition is true. But when the i value is reached to 11, the condition becomes false. Because 11 less than or equal to 10 condition is false then it terminates the loop automatically. And of course, you can also write the decremented for loop by using i minus minus instead of i plus plus. Let us learn the for loop practically. So let me create a file called for.js. I would like to write incremented for loop that is to print 1 to 5 numbers. So I am writing straight away for and inside the for let me write the initial value that is let's say i equal to 1, i less than or equal to 5 and then i plus plus. So that means we will begin with 1 and increase the i value along the way up to 5. But once the i value becomes 6, we want to stop the loop. So i equal to 1, the code executes once. The i equal to 2, code executes once. i equal to 3, again the code. i equal to 4, again the code. i equal to 5, again the code. But i equal to 6, the condition is false, it stops the loop. So you can straight away write your actual process that is printing the i value. Now we are trying to write the decremented loop that is 5 to 1. So we will have the same kind of for loop but this time we have to say i equal to 5 and i greater than or equal to 1 because i should begin with 5 but count down along the way up to 1 and then we would like to say i minus minus as the step value so i equal to 5 the code executes i equal to 4 again the code i equal to 3 i equal to 2 i equal to 1 so each time the code executes once. 
but once the i becomes 0, the condition is false, so it stops the loop. Let's check the output practically. So node4.js, you can see the output of incremented loop as well as decremented loop. So whenever you know how many times you want to execute the code, for example, you want to process the data of 100 employees. So in this case, you know how many times your loop should be executed. For this kind of cases, it is best to use the for loop rather than while loop or do while. But alternatively, whenever you are not sure how many times you want to execute the code, but it depends on the external input, either it depends on the user inputs or getting the data from other resources. For this kind of cases, while loop is the best. The let keyword is almost equivalent to where keyword, which are used to declare the variables in JavaScript. So, what's the exact difference between let and where keyword? Actually, the where keyword is available from the beginning of JavaScript. So, earlier, before the introduction of where keyword in 2015, the only keyword available for variable declaration is where. But after 2015 version of ECMAScript, that is called ES6 or ES2015, we have two keywords to declare the variables, that is let and where. Actually, when you are declaring the global or local variables, that means the variables outside the function or inside the function, there is no difference between where and let. If you are declaring a variable outside the function, both let and where keywords declare a global variable. And also, if you are declaring a variable inside the function, both let and where keywords declare a local variable, which is available only within the same function. So up to this, there is no difference between let and where. But now, whenever we use the let keyword inside the blocks especially, that is either if block, else block, for block, while block, etc. The let keyword declares a block level variable unlike where keyword. So whenever we use the where keyword inside a block, it either declares a global variable or local variable, but the let keyword usage inside the block declares a block level variable which is available or accessible within the same block only. Once the block is closed, the scope of the variable that is declared through let keyword will be closed. And another difference between let and where keyword is that the variable declaration of where keyword will be hoisted up to top of the program, but the variable declarations of let keyword will not be hoisted. The variables that are declared with where keyword only be available starting from the declaration statement up to end of the scope, but those variables are not available to above the declaration. For example, we have declared a variable at line number 10. So that variable is available starting from line number 10 till end of the same scope, but not available in the line numbers between 1 to 9. So you should remember that the where keyword variables will be hoisted up, but let keyword variables will not be hoisted up. Except these two differences, there are no other differences between let and where. You can use the let keyword to declare a simple variable or variable with default value, or you can declare multiple variables also by using let keyword. So the let keyword can replace the use of where keyword. So that is the reason as per ES 2015 version, it is recommended to use the let keyword rather than using where keyword. It's because let keyword also can be used to declare global and local variables just like where keyword. 
And anyways, if you confuse about global local variables and also functions, just wait for the further lectures. We will cover all these topics in detail later. So don't get confused as of now. So let us check the program of let keyword. Let me create a file that is let.js. So I am trying to declare a global variable outside the function. For example, where x equal to 10. So that we can use this global variable anywhere within the program, either inside the function or outside the function. So that global variable always be accessible. In case, instead of where keyword, if you try using let keyword for the same, so there is no difference here. Both where and let keyword creates the global variables. Of course, if you are using let keyword and where keyword inside a function, they will create the local variables. But as of now, we are not aware of functions, right? So I am not showing that example of function now. But let us focus on the block level variables because that is the only difference between where and let keyword. For example, there is a condition. If that condition is true, you would like to execute some code. Let's say here we are using where keyword. So this will exactly create the global variable. Yes. Even though we have written this where keyword inside the if block, this leads to creation of global variable so that the variable that is z is even accessible even after the if statement. For example, if you try printing console.log of z here, it is accessible. So we should get the output 10 here. Let's check it node let.js see we are getting 10 because the where keyword declares a global variable instead of block level variable but now my requirement is i would like to make it as a block level variable that means it should be accessible only up to end of the if statement but it should not be accessible outside so exactly in that case we have to use the let keyword instead of where. In this case, it becomes as block level variable. Now, this variable is accessible only up to end of the if, but not accessible outside. So that is the reason, if you try printing that outside the if block, we will get error. It says that z is not accessible here means z is not defined. It's because the variable z was already declared in the if statement and it's a block level variable. So its scope or lifetime ends once the if block closes. So within the if block that variable is available but not outside it. That is why we are getting this error. That is the exact difference between where and let. See, once again, if you switch to where, now that variable is a global variable that is available even after outside the if statement. So we are getting that value here. But now, once again, if you switch to let keyword, now it is the block level variable it is not accessible outside the block that is outside the if statement. So we are getting that error saying that z is not defined. So mainly for declaration of block level variables, let keyword is recommended because let keyword is the only way to create the block level variables in JavaScript. But other than the block level variables, in case of global or local variables, let or where doesn't make any difference. And moreover, you can try using let keyword 
even in the while block or for loop block because everywhere it always creates the block level variables inside the block. For example, inside the for loop, we can use the let keyword. So, as soon as this for loop closes, the lifetime of this i variable will be closed. See, outside the for loop, I am trying to access that block level variable that is console.log of i. In this case, it is not accessible because as soon as the loop ends here, the lifetime of i variable ends. That's why outside the for loop, the i value is not accessible here. Because as soon as the for loop ends, the block level variable that is i is no longer accessible. That is why we are getting the error saying that i is not defined. But in case, if you are using where keyword instead of let, even after completion of the for loop, the i value is available because it is treated as a global variable instead of block level. So that is why we are getting the last value of the i that is 6. So that is the exact difference between where and let keyword. Okay, let's make it let. And here we will get error and even here also. So at your practice time, uncomment either of these statements, then you must see an error if you are using let keyword here. This is all about let keyword in JavaScript. Generally, in the programming languages, a function is a collection of statements to achieve some particular task. So whenever you write a set of statements to calculate something or to do a particular task in the program, that collection of statements is called as a function. For example, you are going to write a set of statements to calculate simple interest. So all those statements are called as a function. And the function can receive the inputs in the form of parameters and also can produce the output in the form of result. So the process is the function, inputs are the parameters are also called as arguments and the result value is called as written value. For example, for the function that calculates the simple interest, principal amount, rate of interest, and the number of years, these three are the inputs. So these are called parameters. And after calculation, you will find out the simple interest based on the principal amount. So that result value is called as written in case of function. So what that function gives back to the calling portion that is called written value. But what we provide as inputs to the function while invoking the same, those are called arguments or parameters. And in a larger program, you can identify smaller individual tasks. So each smaller and individual task can be represented as a function so that you can reuse the same function many times means the function that is created once can be called multiple times. So reusability and modularity is the best benefits of functions. Whenever you create a function, without calling it, it will not be executed. So a function must be called in order to execute the same. A function doesn't execute on its own. For example, there is a function that is addition and you will supply two numbers as inputs for the same. So in order to execute that function, we have to call that function with its name that is add and supply those two numbers as arguments. So whenever you call the function, that function definition will be executed 
and its return value will be returned back to the calling portion. Let me demonstrate how to create functions practically. So let me create a file called functions.js and here I would like to create a function. We can create the function by using function keyword and within the parentheses you will specify the arguments that means the input values that you want to receive into the function. So if function is a task, for performing that particular task, whichever the input values that you require, all those values must be received as arguments or parameters. For example, I would like to create a function to calculate simple interest. So for calculation of that, I require three input values that is principal amount, rate of interest and the number of years so that based on the amount we will calculate the interest for the specific years. So I am receiving all the parameters that is the input values that I require to perform this particular task. So inside the function I can write the actual statements to perform that calculation or task. So let me declare a variable called simple interest so short name si then the actual formula is principal amount into rate of interest into number of years divided by 100. So that is the formula for simple interest calculation and I would like to give back the result value that is si. So return si. I would like to give back the return value so that the calling portion can receive this value. So even though we have created a function, that function never executes on its own. We have to invoke the function, then only it executes. So in order to invoke the function, let me store the reference of a function inside a variable. So at the beginning, let me create a variable by using either where or let keyword. Here I am using the let keyword. You can also try using the where keyword. It makes no difference. So let and then some variable name. For example, the suitable name for this is get simple interest. Generally, you will name the functions based on the purpose or the requirement of the function. So what this function is trying to do, it is trying to get or return the actual value of the simple interest, right? So the suitable names for this function is get simple interest or simple interest calculator or calculate simple interest. So based on the purpose or target of the function, it is recommended to provide the suitable name. So here the reference of the function is being stored in this variable. So that we can refer to that particular function means we can call that particular function based on this variable name. As of now we have not yet called that particular function. So we will not get any output as of now because we have not yet called the function. So that is what I am trying to say. A function never executes on its own, we have to invoke it manually. A function only acts as a group of statements and it can receive the inputs in the form of parameters and can produce the output by using return statement. And after the return, we can either provide parentheses and of course that is optional. So in order to really execute the particular code, we have to call the function by its name. Here what is the name of the function? That means what is the name of the variable that stores reference of the function? That is get simple interest. So we have to call with its name. And now this returned value will be given back to the calling portion 
but we are not utilizing it anyway. Means we are not storing the return value in a variable or we are not printing the same by using console.log. So we have to utilize the return value. For example, let's say console.log. So inside your console.log, we are trying to invoke the get simple interest function. So that this particular written value will be written back to the column portion. For example, the written value is 1000. So that 1000 will be printed by using console.log. But as of now, we are getting NAN, which indicates not a number. It's because we are not supplying essential input values. So while invoking the function, we have to pass essential input values. Let's say for example, I am trying to supply 1000 and rate of interest for example 6.7 and a number of years, let's say for example 3 years. So the execution sequence of this program is Whenever it encounters this particular first statement, it only just creates the function and stores that function reference in this variable, but it doesn't execute anything inside the function body. That means any code that is present inside these braces will not be executed at the beginning. It only creates a function in memory and stores its reference in this variable that is get simple interest. And next later, we are trying to call the same function by using its variable name and we are trying to supply its three values that is 1000, 6.7 and 3. Of course, you can pass any input values whatever you wish. These three values will be automatically supplied into the respective parameters. Meaning, first this 1000 will be assigned into principal, this 6.7 will be initialized into rate of interest and this value 3 will be assigned into the number of years. So as of now, principal is 1000 and rate of interest is 6.7 and number of years is 3. So we will multiply the same here in the formula that is 1000 into rate of interest that is 6.7 into number of years that is 3. So 1000 into 6.7 into 3 whole divided by 100. That result value is 201. So that value 201 will be stored in this variable called SI. And the same gets returned from this return statement. So that value 201 will come back to the same calling portion from where we have originally called the function. So this statement is equivalent to 201. And that value will be supplied to the console.log statement so that it will print the actual value that is 201 finally. So the main point that you should remember in this flow is a function will not execute just when you create the same. It really executes only when you call the function. And of course, the same function executes every time when you call the function. Suppose we have invoked the same function 100 times. So the same function executes 100 times. Each time it receives the new values, redo the calculation, and reproduce the written value. So in that way, the function is being reusable. That means a function that is created once can be called multiple times. So let's run this code finally. So we got the output as expected, that is 201. You can call the same function multiple times. Let's say for example, I am trying to supply difference principal amount, let's say 7000 and 4.5 interest and a number of years, so let's say 10. So we got the relevant output that is 3150. And moreover, 
you can receive the returned value into another variable instead of printing the same directly. For example, I am trying to print it in a variable. Let's say simple interest 1. And I am trying to receive the second value into another variable. Let's say simple interest 2. And then we can print the same. This is another way to get the written value. Of course, it gives the same output as it before. But the advantage of receiving the written value into another variable is that, in future, you can reuse the same value for other calculation or something else. Means, for example, you have another formula based on these values. So in that case, instead of recalling the same function once again, you can reuse the same values in that formula. So whenever you don't want to reuse that written value into another formula, then you can directly use that function inside the output statement that is console.log. But if you want to reuse the written value for another formula, in that case, store the written value in a variable and print the same later. So overall, the execution sequence is, the function will not be executed on its own first. The starting point is here, that is when you call the function, it goes to the function definition and executes all these statements like the first statement and second. And whenever it sees the written value, it comes back to the calling portion along with the written value. So that written value will be stored in this variable that is mentioned here. This is how to create the function with arguments as well as written value. Sometimes you want to perform a smaller task where no input values are required. Then you will create the function without arguments and with no written value. In that case, the function executes a set of statements but doesn't receive any values and will not produce even written value. So those type of functions are called as functions with no arguments and no written. Let me create a file functions2.js. I would like to demonstrate functions with no arguments and no written. For example, there is a simple function, let's say show city. And I would like to print some output in this case. Let's say for example, New York. So that you can call the same function multiple times. As of now, this program doesn't produce any output because the function has not been called at least once. So we have to call that function at least once, then only it executes. And this is another way to create the function. That is, either you can write let variable name equal to function. Or another way of creating the same is function space variable name. So with this given name, a variable will be created. That variable stores reference of this function. All right. Now we are trying to run this program. So we are getting that output once because we have called it only once. Let's call the same multiple times. So each time whenever you call the function, from the calling portion, it jumps to definition of the function and executes all these statements that are present here. So after completion of all the statements execution, it comes back to the same portion that is where it is called originally. So in that way, this statement will be completed. And later, when you call the same function once again, the same process repeats once again. So again, it goes to the definition of the function. It executes all these statements one by one and comes back to the same place where it is originally called. In this way, each time when you call the function, the execution sequence jumps to the calling portion and comes back to the same place 
where it is called. It happens every time when you call the function. So, since we have called that function three times, so three times it goes to the function and executes the body of the function. So, we will get the same output three times here. This is how you create simple functions with no arguments and no written value. In JavaScript, one of the most important concepts is objects because JavaScript is fundamentally an object-oriented programming. So what is an object? In programming languages, an object is a physical item. That means it represents a physical thing or person. For example, you are an object. Your car is an object. So every physical thing is an object and each object contains some details and operations. Here those details are called properties and operations are called methods. For example, you take a car as an object. Its details such as car number, car model, car color, all these details are examples of properties of that particular object. And using that particular object, you can perform various operations. Each and every operation of that particular object are called as methods. For example, you can start the car, you can change the gear, you can stop the car. So all these operations are examples of methods that are related to a specific object. Like this, every object contains the properties and methods. So object is a memory unit which stores a set of properties and methods. And each property and method contains a name and value. Here the names are called keys and the values are values itself. For example, you take a property called car number. This particular name that is car number is an example of key and 1234 is the value. Like this, car number, car model, car color, these are all the properties which are also called as keys. So each property contains a value. And similarly, methods contain a key and value, but here the value is a function. For example, start is the name, but it contains a function. So in that function, you can write a code to manipulate that particular object. So the intention of an object is to group up some details and corresponding operations to manipulate that particular details. Like for another example, let's say there is a person. So that person is an object and he has a property called age. For example, age equal to 20 as of now. And we have a method called birthday, which will manipulate the age value. That means every time when you call the birthday function, the age will be increased. So methods are meant for manipulating the properties. Some people may think or say that JavaScript is an object based language, but it is not correct. It is absolutely object oriented programming language, but it may not support classes earlier, but in the recent updates of JavaScript, classes are absolutely supported. So with or without classes, JavaScript is always object oriented programming language, which supports objects and all other features of object oriented programming. So how will you create an object? Object literal is the way to create an object. In this case, you will write a brace. Here the object brace begins and object brace ends. And inside these braces, you will write a set of properties and methods. You can write any number of properties and methods inside that particular object. For example, a property stores a number, but there is a method called increment, which increases the value of the property. And after that, this particular object literal will be stored in the memory. 
and you need a variable to store reference of that particular object. So there must be a variable to store reference of the object so that every time you can access that particular object using the variable. For example, you can write like variable dot property, variable dot method to access the properties methods that are stored in that object. So the variable stores reference to the object. This is how you create objects in JavaScript. But this is all theoretical. Let me create the objects practically in a program. So let me create a file objectliterals.js. All right. I would like to create an object. Whenever you open the brace and close the brace, that is absolutely an object. Yes, successfully we have created an object, but as of now it is empty object. It has no keys and no values. Let me add some keys in that object. For example, A and B. Here, A and B are examples of the keys that are present inside the object. So, as of now in the memory, you can assume there is an object. It contains two keys, that is A and B, but it has no values as of now. Both keys are empty as of now. We have to add some values into that. Whenever you add a value that is of number type or string type or boolean type, it is called as regular property. But whenever we add a function into the particular key, the same is called as method. So methods are nothing but keys that stores reference of a function. So let me add a value that is for example 10. See in this case we should not use equal to. We have to use colon to assign a value into the property. So since we have assigned a numerical value, this A is called as regular property. But let's say B equal to something like function. In JavaScript, functions are first class citizens, which means that you can store functions as a value. So just like other values such as numbers, strings, boolean values, etc. You can absolutely assign a function as a value. So in this case, the key called b stores reference of the function value. In this case, the function is treated as a value. So we have an object. It has two keys, that is a and b. But the key called a is called as a property because its value is a simple value that is numerical value. But the key called b contains a reference of a function, so b can be called as a method. Using with the help of a, you can access the value called 10. And using with the name b, you can access the value called function. So we have successfully created an object. Let me print that value. So when you run this code, we are getting the same object as it is that we have created here. But the problem is, in the further statements, we are unable to access that object because we don't have a reference variable that points to the particular object. So always, whenever we create an object, it is advisable to create a variable so that the variable stores reference of this particular object. So as an advantage, you can access that same object by using that variable later in the further code. So let me cut the code here and let me create a variable, for example, x. In place of x, of course, you can give any other name. It is just a variable name. And of course, 
you can use any other keyword to declare the variable either where or let keyword it doesn't make any special difference here we already know the difference between let and where in the earlier lectures so as of now we can assume there is an object and it has two keys that is a and b the value of a is 10 so the a can be called as a property but the value of b is a function so that's why the b can be called as a method so in this object we have one property and one method and there is a variable called x outside but this variable contains a reference to the object every time you can access that object by using x you need this extra reference variable because if this variable is not present you are unable to access that object because objects are nameless you cannot give a specific name for the object object is just a concept it exists in memory it is just a collection of properties and methods here we can call this x as a reference variable because by definition a reference variable is a variable that stores reference of an object in other words the reference variable always points to an object so instead of simple names like a and b let me make some meaningful names for example let's say person name let me store the string value for example scott and the name of the function is let's say for example birthday and in this function we can store any code for example printed text like happy birthday and this object reference is stored in this variable called x instead of x let's provide the name like person and we can print that object here so as of now we are getting the same object that we have created here and you can access each and every property and method by using that reference variable for example in the next statement we are writing the property name that is person name and later we are calling birthday so in this case as you can check first we are accessing the name that is person dot person name and later we are accessing the function called person dot birthday but it is a function so we can call it right so i just keep the parenthesis in order to call that function so let's check it out so in this case the person dot person name is scott and we have invoked that function called birthday and of course we have written a statement called console.log so it prints the text like happy birthday but this function doesn't return any value right see this function that is stored in the property called birthday doesn't return any value it has no return statement i think you know the rule in javascript that is whenever you don't return anything explicitly in the function by default javascript returns undefined from that function so that is the reason this birthday function now returns undefined the same is received here so that's why we got undefined as output here now we can do one thing we can return the value instead of printing so that this returned value will be received into this place so in this place we will get that happy birthday so we will get the same as output by using console.log statement here so let's check it out and let me comment this statement 
So for person dot person name, we are getting Scott. But for person dot birthday, we are getting that message Happy birthday. And moreover, you can also write this object in multiple lines. Let's say one line for property and another line for function. But still it works in the same way as it before. So it is up to you. Generally, if you are creating a simple object that contains just one or two properties and methods, you might be writing the same in the same line. But in case of objects with multiple properties and methods, you can write line by line so that it will be readable and understandable easily. This is how do you create a simple and single object in JavaScript. But really, this knowledge of JavaScript functions, objects and arrays is not enough for real world application development. To crack the JavaScript interviews, you require in-depth knowledge of JavaScript. You need to understand a lot of things about JavaScript and all of that is covered in this course that is web development course. So in this web development course, I have covered a lot of JavaScript concepts including the basics to advanced. See in this section of JavaScript language fundamentals, we will cover the language basics including the all operators, if statements, loops and all of these practically with examples. And also you will find assignments to practice yourself, to test your knowledge and to make yourself comfortable in coding. See the point here is that just learning a topic is not enough until you really apply the same in a real case study. So that is the reason in our web development course, always we solve the problems by using case studies and also we will do the assignments. So that whenever you learn a specific topic, you need to apply the same really on a specific assignment so that you can never forget the same. See, in this section of functions, we cover a lot of in-depth topics related to functions including the default arguments, callback functions, higher order functions, immediately invoked functions, etc. Really, all these topics are required to understand JavaScript coding and also to crack JavaScript interviews. This is another great section that is objects in JavaScript, which covers all essential topics and object oriented programming concepts in JavaScript such as destructuring, inheritance, polymorphism, protochain, scope chain, lexical environment, polymorphism, constructor functions, etc. Apart from these functions and objects, we cover all the topics of arrays, including all the possible methods of arrays, ES6 classes, JSON, and also jQuery, Node.js, and bootstrap as well. And of course, at the beginning itself, this course covers complete knowledge about HTML5 and CSS3 with a project called India Tourism website. And here we cover all the concepts of HTML forms, selectors, responsive page layout, and CSS flexbox and CSS grid. And we will apply all these concepts that we learned in a practical project called India Tourism website. So this course provides a lot of value for the students. If you are interested, you can check out the same. You can find a link for this web development course at the last lecture of this course.